the struggle. I've got peace in the storm. I've got strength in the battle. I don't fear anymore. I'm a child of heaven. My hope is secure. I've got joy because I've got Jesus. just another opportunity to worship him freely and thank him for what he's done for us. And so this morning we're going to do what we always do here at Generations Church. We're going to love on each other and shake hands and welcome everybody in this place this morning. And if you would just go ahead and do that and then we'll come back and we'll continue on with our worship service this morning. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's so great to be back here this morning and just thank God for, for what he's done. I woke up this morning and the devil tried to steal my joy this morning. I sent a text and said, I ain't going to be there. I've got tendonitis in my Achilles. I'm hurting. As soon as my foot hit the floor, 
And I sent that text to Adam and Chris and Joan and said, and Melissa said, not gonna be here. And I got up and I walked around the bed and I stepped out of the bedroom into the living room. And I said, he ain't gonna win today. He tried. So I can't dance like I normally dance today because I might fall over. But there's no reason, no reason to not praise the King, amen. So no matter what we're going through this morning, you got to praise him through the storm, amen. And you, I've got joy, we've got joy. So we're going to continue worship this morning. We're going to sing a little bit about the resurrecting King, amen. So let's sing this morning. Thank you, Father God, this morning for your faithfulness. Amen.
worship for you this morning. You're worthy of it all. in the middle of times that are difficult or, or, or chaotic or frustrating, Lord, we have a choice to make. And Father, this morning, we take a moment and we remind ourselves that the choice should always be that you're worthy of it all. So God, this morning, we don't ignore what's going on in our lives, God. If, if, if we're frustrated, we acknowledge it. If we're hurting, we acknowledge it. If we're confused, if we're lost, if we're trying so hard, God, we acknowledge all those things. God, but we just take a moment and we make sure that we praise you above all of that. God, we just take a moment and we make sure that we say that you're worthy. You're good. You're holy, God, and that you are working things out on our behalf, God. And because we know that is true, we can approach you with confidence. God, we can take all those things. That are, that are just vying for our attention, Lord, and we can just set them aside for just a moment. Let's make sure that our eyes stay fixed on you. Lord, as we can to just push forward with service, God, and navigating those things that are in front of us. God, we thank you that your spirit is in us going to We thank you that you're giving us power. God, that you're giving us a sound mind. God, that you have resourced us with your spirit so that when those mind games come, God, when those voices come, when that scheme of the enemy comes, Lord, that we can say that we don't have to participate in that version of life. Because you have saved us. You have redeemed us. You've restored us. You've chosen us and you've called us. And that's the version of life that we walk in this morning. Father, we love you. We honor you. We praise you because you're worthy of it all. In Jesus' name.
Come on, let's give him some praise again. Come on. If he's worthy, give him some praise this morning. Um, just a little housekeeping before I get started this morning. Today's the third week of Grow. We're going to jump right in right after service. We already have food out in the back, so once service is over, go ahead and grab your plate. We're going to jump in really quick this morning because I'm going to Florida when we're done. So, <laughs> so I might preach, I might teach, I'll preach really fast and then I'll teach really fast. How's that for you? You excited? Man, you guys look good this morning. Especially you, Kimmy. You're looking really good today. I don't know if Daryl told you that, but I will this morning. So, he did. I, he did. I know how he is. Say focus. Focus. You ever notice how God will tell you something sometimes, and, and you'll begin to walk in towards the thing that he told you, and as you walk towards it, you'll, you'll begin to understand it in your humanity. You didn't really fully understand what he actually wanted to show you in that time. And, but as you walk towards it, his purpose actually reveals itself, and sometimes it's different than what you had in mind. Is it just me, or has anybody else in the room been like that? Like we came into this year, so usually every year about summertime when I take my break, and I don't preach in July, God will begin stirring the word for the next year. I already kind of know what he wants us to do next year. Uh, and, but I go to the beach every summer, and I got to put my toes in the sand. I'm sorry about that. I got to put my toes in the sand, and I got to sand. You know how you get when you get to the ocean, and you just look out, and you just see the majesty of God, and how big and awesome he is. It can create something like that. And you, and you realize how insignificant you actually are in those moments. And so... I have to go there to confirm it, to get in his presence right there at the beach. But last year he told us this was going to be a year of focus. And I had in mind something totally different than what God did, to be honest. I had in mind we was going to get focused on this work we needed to do. I had this idea we were going to just start getting out there and focusing and get focused on what God's calling us to do. But what God really wanted us to do this year, as we've walked through this year, I've discovered he wanted us to turn our eyes inside. He wants us to begin looking inward at ourselves and really get focused in on the people that we are. Because here's the truth. <laughs> if God hasn't changed anything in us, how are we going to go out somewhere and change anything anywhere we go? We, first of all, have to be changed. We have to be changed. And we started out in Hebrews 12, 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witness, let us fix our eyes on Jesus stripping away every sin and thing that comes into our lives, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, and he took on the shame. And now he sits at the right hand of God. And so this year as a church, God has really wanted us, that was the, that was the, the verse that I used for my first message this year, is to get our eyes back on Jesus. I don't know about you, but life can happen sometimes. Things can go wrong, and it'll get your eyes all in different directions. But Jesus, this year, wants us to focus our eyes on him. And that's what this series we're in is all about. We're talking about the God cards. And what I said the first week is like, these God cards that we're talking about, they're God cards that you can use in any environment you go into. Like You can go into the workplace. You can use them in your family. You can use them in your marriage. You can use them on your kids. You can just play those cards. But really, these cards are intended to be played on ourselves first. Week one, we talked about the first card, love God. And as believers, we need to love God. We need to focus and, and, and work on our devotion to Jesus. We need to work on our character, and we need to work on our calling. Because if you're not really working on those three things, how can you say that you are really loving God? Because God put some things in you to do. He created you a certain way. And if you're not focusing on your character, if you're not getting close to Him, and if you're not developing your calling... The reason God puts you on this earth, how are you truly loving God? Last week, Pastor Adam talked to us about loving people. And he talked about being real. Like, how often do we show up in church going, hey, Mario? Like, we want to be joyful because we don't want to come in and just be Eeyores in the environment. But we need to be real, too. We need to come in with a smile on our face like Mario did this morning. He's like, I'm hurting, my ankle's hurting, but God gets all the glory. We got to be real people. We got to let the things that are in our lives really show because here's the thing if you do that, there's somebody in this room that needs you to do that because they're going through something that you may have gone through or they may be available to help you in that moment because they're going, when we're real, when we're authentic, 
Jesus can really use us. God can't bless who you pretend to be. He can only, he can only bless who you really are. And so this morning, we're going to turn the corner. We're going to look at week three. And by the way, these four cards we're talking about, these are values that God has put on my heart that we're inserting into this culture of this church. Like if you serve on a team, these are the values. You need to love God. The best thing you can do for this church is focus on your life from Jesus. Period. And so first week we talked about love God. Last week we talked about love people. And this week we're going to talk about pursue excellence. Say that with me. Pursue excellence. Not be excellent, but pursue excellence. Jesus. We love you. We are so grateful that you are a good God. You're God that loves. You're God that is the example that is before us of what love actually is. Lord Jesus, help us to love people the way you love people. Jesus, help us to love the Father the way that you love the Father. Father, I pray this morning as we go through the next few moments, Lord, that you would just open our hearts. I know for each person in this room, we're all struggling in some area if we have air going through our lungs this morning. I pray that this morning you would touch those areas of our lives individually like only you can. Holy Spirit, come. Ignite something in us that cannot be put out. In Jesus' name, amen. I usually read my scripture before I do that, but I forgot. We'll get back to it in a minute. I'll read you one verse. I was going to read you the whole context of that, but it says, in Mark 7, 37, it says, people were overwhelmed with amazement. See, Jesus had been doing some things. He'd been doing some healing and doing some things, and it said, the people were overwhelmed with amazement and said, he has done everything very well. Where are my parents at? I know I look for my parents all the time. Yeah, yeah my parents are over there, but... Okay, where are the, I got to rephrase that question because my parents are in the room when I say that. Where are the parents in the room? There we go, there we go, there we go. Who wants to be a parent one day if you're not yet? Okay, that's good, that's good. That is really good, that is really good. Remember when you first became a parent way back in the day? You thought you knew everything? You know what I'm talking about? Like, like you knew how kids were supposed to be raised? You thought you knew it. I didn't say you did. You thought you knew it. You know how kids were supposed to be raised and then you just live a little bit and you realize after about year one or two, you don't know anything. Uh, Pastor Chris Rogers said this. He, just, he wrote a book on prayer not long ago and he said, this is why at 20 years old I would have wrote a book on parenting and at 60 I'm writing a book on prayer. Because as you live through life, the longer you go through it, that you really can't do anything without the help of God. And so, me as a parent, and I know this is none of y'all because you're a lot better than I am, but... When I started out, I thought I had it figured out. Your parenting oftentimes is a response to how you were parented. Because I grew up in my mom's house who had no rules, and I could do whatever I wanted to do. Um, if I'd have been in my dad's house, that wouldn't have been the case. But that's just the way I grew up. So as a parent, I had a lot of rules. And I was trying to build these perfect children. I was trying to, like, they couldn't do anything wrong, or dad was, and I still have this tendency in me, by the way, guys, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. Just think if you were my kids. I'll let that sink in for a minute. But anyway. I realized one day that that didn't work. It was about the time the second one was a teenager. I count the first one as my sister because she was a little 11 years old when I began raising her. But on the second one with my son, I realized this does not work. Perfection is not something that you can put in your kids. It's not something you can put on a person. And so after that, after when the, where's, are there any other ones in the room? A few other ones? No, they're not in here. They're in the back. They're back there. They had it easy. They got away with everything. Of course, they didn't do anything because we didn't have pressure on them to be perfect. So they just kind of lived their lives and, and, and they ran into some things on their own and they self-corrected. You ever seen how kids do that sometimes? If the parents just stay off of them, they'll figure it out when they get their own pain. Once they actually have to endure it and you keep stopping them and saving them from it, they'll figure it out on their own a whole bunch, a whole lot easier. 
And so here's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about excellence. And excellence is not perfection. See, pe- perfection... Blah, blah, blah. You ever get stumbled over your words? Checking. Perfection is an unattainable goal. Have you tried to live that way? Have you tried to be perfect? But excellence is about progress. Excellence is about being a little bit better today than I was yesterday. It's not about, it's not about going, hey, Zach, I got to be better than you today. No, it's about saying, hey, Chris, I need to be better today than I was yesterday. Excellence is about getting a little bit better every single day, getting a little bit better than I was yesterday. It's about, perfection is about a, an arrival point. Because if you're going to be perfect, there's a point in time when you could arrive. Excellence is not about that. Excellence is about being better every day. Excellence is about, actually, it's not about doing more. It's about doing less. Think about that. There's a guy who wrote a book. It's called Essentialism. And he calls it the disciplined pursuit of less. Because if you're ever going to be great at something, if you're ever going to be really good at something, you need to focus in on a few things that you're gifted at and do those very well. Anybody ever been to a Ruth Chris steakhouse? No? What about, uh, what's the one where they bring the meat out to the table and they cut that up? Go go to chow. Anybody been to one of those? Good, isn't it? I'm not going to say the name. Anybody ever been to a hometown buffet? So when you go in, you take the tray and you go up to the counter and they give you the drink and then you go out. They got salad and chicken and hamburger and steak and um some of it might be all right, but ain't none of it any good because they're so disfocused in what they're doing. Excellence is about being focused in a very few areas. Because let's just be real. The pursuit of perfection is an unattainable goal because there's only one person who's ever been perfect, and his name's Jesus. Here's a question you could ask about excellence in any environment is this. If a human who cared walked in this room right now, what would they do? If there was a human that cared, walked in, what would they do? The answer to that would be what excellence would actually be. So there's three things I want to tell you about this morning. Say three things. Three things to live an excellent life. Number one, do things well. That's obvious, right? None of these are going to be like, Oh, man, that was, like, really good. I never thought of that before. But sometimes the the, the things in life that give you the best results are the most simplest but the hardest to do. Do things well. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. You ever had a person that you knew that they could just execute on anything, anytime? Like you gave them something and they always gave it their best shot no matter what? Even when it wasn't perfect, it was still good. Even when they did it wrong and failed, they learned from it and they got better. Does anybody know a person like that? Are you the person like that? All the time? Sometimes you should be. Here's what happens to a lot of us. A lot of us will go, yeah, I want to do some great things in this life and we'll get moving forward. And as long as it's our thing, we'll give it all the effort. Like, as long as it's our thing. If you, but here's what happens. This happens in your workplace. I see this happen in the church place. Uh, when, when there's a decision made that you don't totally agree with, <laughs> you do what? You just do half the work? Is that what you? You're just halfway on board, yeah. And so, and this happens at work too. Your boss does something, and, and there's this decision made, and you're like, ah, uh, and you give it half the effort. You don't really give it all the effort. There's so many, there's so many organizations and churches in this world that aren't seeing their potential because there's a bunch of people in it that's because they don't agree with everything. And we're not all going to agree with everything all the time anyway. We just go, oh, I don't like that, and so I'm not going to give it my all. You see, you see what happens when football teams do that, right? Sometimes you get a bunch of superstars that think they know it all and they get on the same team and they don't like the direction the team's going. And then the next thing you know, the locker room's in chaos. It's a toxic culture. And everybody, they're on ESPN every night because they did something stupid that day. But there are so many organizations that aren't moving forward because people aren't giving it their all because they don't really agree with the decision that was made. Here's the thing. Because we've been called to be submitted to authority that's in your workplace or wherever. Submission's never actually submission until you disagree. Let that sink in for a moment. Like, I don't have to submit to something that I, This actually happened to me this week. 
there was something I didn't like in a leadership position over me. I was working hard to attain something, and they made a decision that I wouldn't be able to attain that thing. And I had to check my spirit for about five days and just shut up because I wanted to go say something. And I realized I was going to be talking about this this week. So I figured God may be putting, stirring something in me right in this moment so that I can learn. See, we're all in this together. Like, just because I'm standing up here talking to you, like, some days if you go, man, Chris, that was a good minute. Well, maybe I was really talking to myself that day. You know what I'm saying? But we're all in this together. And so here's what happens, though, when that comes into an organization. You secretly actually sit back and start rooting for the failure of what's going on because your hands are off. I heard one pastor say this. He goes, let me. He said, you can do the wrong thing You'd be better off to do the wrong thing in a good culture than to do the right thing in a bad culture. Because he said, because good culture, good fertile story has this way of th making things grow that shouldn't. Just because the soil is so fertile, there's joy. There's camaraderie. You ever been on teams like that? Or around people like that? There's just something about it when you can have like C players they're all on the same page that will outperform A players when they're all just doing their own thing day in and day out. Number two, first thing is do things well. We need to do things well. Number two, do things before you are asked. This is how you become excellent. Do things before you are asked. This is about taking initiative. Like, here's a good example. When you walked to the door this morning, was there a piece of trash on the floor? And you just walked, oh, somebody needs to pick that up. Well, <laughs> did you just take the initiative to reach down there? And pick it up because if this is our house, this is all our house. And you wouldn't walk around your house and just walk by trash, would you? But this is about taking initiative. James 2 says this. Anybody know this verse? It's very controversial in Scripture when he says faith without deeds is dead. The context of that, he's talking about, hey, you see somebody over there and they're hungry or they're starving or they need a code. And you just go and say, oh, oh I hope, wish you well. I'll pray for you. He says, you can show me your faith by your works, but I'm going to show you my faith by my deeds because faith without works is dead. Now, that's not about salvation. Let's just get that on the table right now. But your faith is useless to the people around you. Your faith is useless to the environments you're in unless you actually take some action. James 4.17 says this, that to the man who knows what to do and doesn't do it, it is sin and so we're always looking at sins that people are committing or we're committing but there are also sins that we there's called sins of omission God has asked us to do things and we just omit things and we get away with it we think because nobody knows what God told us to do but he's telling us See, this doing things before you ask, it speaks to commitment. I said this a few weeks ago. I said, trying, if we're going to come try at something, that comes before actually committing. Training comes after commitment. Because when you're really committed to doing something, you'll, 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 go, you'll go first. You'll get ahead in it. You'll get prepared beforehand. Like how many, people, how many guys know anybody, and I know Mario knows this, as, as, as players go up in the ranks, you got – you know, little league, high school, college, professional. When you get to that professional level, what's your coaching like at that level? You have multiple coaches. See, the higher up you go, the more coaching you need. So you got to prepare beforehand. You got to get that coaching inside of you. What are you doing in your life to prepare to take initiative to do the thing that God has asked you to do? Do you have coaching? Do you have mentors? Do you have spiritual fathers and mothers in your life? You can answer. Okay. Everybody? You don't have to raise your hand. If you don't, that's okay. For now. But now you know. So after now, that's not okay. We all need people who speak into our lives. Like if you're ever going to become the person, I hear this all the time. Oh, we'll just trust God and it'll do it. Not, yeah, that's great. That's good. But that's, this life that we're here to live together it's about sowing into one, each, one another. It's about leaning on one another. It's about people who's gone ahead, who are a little bit further ahead, to reach back and pull other people ahead. 
Just think of Joshua. He had Moses. He sat there with Moses behind him for 40 years before he had his shot. Elisha. He had Elijah. You get into the New Testament, the disciples, that, one scripture says they're a bunch of idiots, but they were just with Jesus for a long time and Jesus sat with them and because Jesus sat with them and pulled them along, those 12 men went and changed the earth. We got Paul training up young Timothy. And I asked, do you have spiritual mentors? And number two, if you do, and if you're a little further ahead, do you have people that you're pouring back into? Like in this church, if we want to see it go, grow, you know what we need? There's two things we need to see this thing go. I mean, there's a lot of things we need, but here's two specific things that everybody needs, and there are two things that are really hard to get. It's more money than you actually need, and it's more leaders than you actually need. Because when oppor opportunity arrives, it's too late to prepare. You got to be ready beforehand. You got to be stepping out beforehand. And so I ask again, do you have a coach? I have a coach. I actually pay money to somebody that coaches me every month. And it's not cheap money. But I have a, I have a phone call with them for an hour once a month. And then they sew into me through other ways throughout the month. Where they teach me things. And actually this person's like way ahead of me. He's a pastor that has a church that has 32 campuses. And... I say that to say, are you allowing somebody to come and pull you along? If you're not, we're going to start some small groups in October. And that's a great place to get spiritual connection and to get going. Number three, so the number one was do things well. Number two, do things before you're asked. Number three, do, thing, do more than is expected. We live in this right now generation. This had nothing to do with your generation because we're in that generation too. We like things right now. Like if we put forth the effort, we want the return right now. If we do the work, we want the pay right now. I used to hear this all the time and I don't hear it much anymore. That it would be like, do more than is required of you at your job as an investment in your future. See, we want to do more than was required of us so we can get the pay this week. But if you actually go and make it a habit to do more than is required of you day in and day out, you'll see compounded interest over time because you're investing in the future. See, we want this ROI that's fair in the moment. God didn't put us here for ROI that's fair in the moment. See, God put us here so that we could do work that shows up in heaven. Like, we're here so that we see lost people found. We're here so we see found people pastor. We're here so that we see pastored people discipled. And we're here so that we see discipled people go make a difference. Go make a difference for what? Eternity. Reaching people. Sowing into people. I love, there's some people in, in this church that, that, that do some work with some people. I'm being kind of generic, I guess, is in this. But they go all the time and serve a group of women and just sow into them. Not asking for anything in return. Mike and Wendy Johnson do a lot. Mama does too. Deborah is there. And people don't see that. God does. But here's what I know. I've watched what has happened in some lives of women as they just sow into them. And, and you guys may not see the return right now. But over the next couple of years, you're going to see some returns that will blow your mind. Not because you're so good, but because you're faithful to a God who's so good. And uh, Wendy does that behind the scenes to a lot of young people in this church too, and people do not see it. And I appreciate it. And it is seen. Are you the kind of person that looks around and stops at the point of fear? Are you like Jesus who pushed fear aside for the return of a lifetime? You can come on down. So we said excellence is not perfection. 
But to attain it, you need to do things well. You need to do things before you're asked. You need to do things more than is expected. But here's the reality. Excellence is a mind shift. It's a shifting of your perspective. Romans 12, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is the way that you truly worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. It's really interesting. Paul spent 11 chapters getting to this point in his book. He starts out in Romans chapter 1 and he talks about how the world has gone to hell in a handbasket. People are running around doing everything they shouldn't be doing. And he says in there, he goes, but, but they're without excuse because all you got to do is look around and you can see God speaks of his existence and his glory just through creation. And so Paul begins to build this case. It's not a case, it's a, it's a true thing about how we're totally hopeless without the person of Jesus. And how we've all fallen short, how we've all failed, but through Jesus Christ's gift, we can have eternal life. And he builds this case for 11 chapters and he shows how Israel would come and go and fall and, that, and we can all relate to that. You know, God helps us and then we do good for a little bit and then we stumble again. He gets to chapter 12. And he takes a shift. And he starts talking, because of what God has already done for you. What Jesus has already done for you. We live the Christian life sometimes as a got to. Oh, I got to do this. Because of what Jesus has done for you, we get to. We get to present our bodies as a holy living sacrifice to him and worship. See, perfection sits back on its heels and it waits for the right conditions. Excellence is a daily decision to get back on the altar. Excellence is a daily decision to go, you know what, I got punched in the mouth yesterday. But today, I'm going back again. I'm getting on that altar again. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to lean into Him. I get to do this. The greatest gap between people who make a difference and those who don't is the decision to live a life of excellence. To do things well, to do more than it's asked of you, and to do more than is expected. I, uh, I give you a date. Y'all won't be surprised though. September the 1st, 2003. My whole world had just fallen apart within the last 10 days. It's Labor Day, September the 1st. 2003 I had had a small group leader before that very first small group I ever was in the, the, the season of group you know how the semesters are had ended probably in May I called him 7 a.m. September the 1st Labor Day he answers the phone and I said hey man kind of told him what was going on he said where you at I'll come and meet you 7 a.m. September Labor Day 
gets out of his bed, comes and meets me at the Waffle House. It's no longer there, right there at 75 and 138. Used to be right there. Sat there on Labor Day. As I poured my heart out. And this is only what God could do. Everything that I was sharing with him, he had been through. Not only had he been through it, but he had found victory in it. But this was my small group leader. Small groups was over. He didn't have to get out of his bed at 7 a.m. while he was still asleep when I called him on Labor Day morning to come up there and talk to me. But I can tell you this. God may have done something else, but it is a big reason why I'm standing here today. It's because somebody cared enough. That's what it looks like when somebody who walks into the room to care that cares. Because they'll 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 lay their things aside. They'll sacrifice their own life to make a difference in somebody else's life. What kind of person are you going to be? Are you going to be a person that pursues excellence? Not perfection, because it's fleeting. Because you're going to fail as you do it. Failure's not a problem. Failure's inevitable. John Maxwell says this, we all live in the same world, but we all don't have the same world. Because some of us Don't allow God to shift our mindset. To let us see the opportunities in our lives to make a difference in other people's lives. Here's my challenge to you this week. It may not happen to you, but it probably will. Somebody's going to need something. And you may be busy. And you may have something on your plate. That's the time. You say, nah, I'm going to pursue this excellent life of loving God, of loving people, and making a difference in people's lives. Jesus. We come to you grateful. That when we were without hope and utterly helpless, you came for us. Help us to be people who are just present in the moment of the lives of the people that need us the most. In every environment we find ourselves, whether it's at work or at home, help us to be present people who live for others maybe you're here this morning and you're like I don't know about all this Jesus stuff I'm not really sure about it well here's the thing we were all and we are all utterly helpless without his love when Adam sinned in the garden it separated all humanity from God and there's nothing on this world that we could ever do to, to, to earn our way back to God because there's the, the, the standard is perfection and there's none of us that are we see all through this narrative of the Old Testament Israel trying to do good and just once again falling short over and over and over and over again and the point of the whole narrative of the Old Testament is to show us that we can't do it but Jesus came, lived a perfect, sinless life, got on a cross for you and I, and was put to death, buried, resurrected in three days. And the Bible tells us that if we'll put our faith and trust in Him, what He did, not what we can do, but what He did, we can have be united back with the Father and have eternal life and be able to spend eternity in heaven with Him one day.
Maybe you're here and you don't know how to express that. Well, here's an easy way. It's about trusting in what Christ did for us, but you may express that through a prayer, something like this. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Right now, the best that I know how, I'm asking you to come into my life. Come and live with me. Help me to come more like you. Each day. Jesus name. Amen. There we go. You guys doing all right? You guys glad you came to the house this morning? Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're going to dismiss here in just a second. A couple of things before we do. Very first thing, and if it is your first time with us, we are so glad that you are here. You are our VIP. We would love for you to just take a moment. There's a connection card in the seat in front of you. If you'll just scan that QR code with your phone, let us have a record of your visit. We would love to know that you were here. Um, please make sure that you stop by the table on your way out because we have a free gift for you. We'd love to put something in your hands as well. Um, if you are looking to make arrangements to give, all of the usual ways are available to you. The bucket is in the back of the room. There's a giving QR code on that connection card as well, so you can do so in either of those ways. And Pastor Chris mentioned it, but we have Grow right after service again, so we got our third week of Grow. Please make plans to stay after for that. We've got snacks in the back of the room. We're going to knock that out pretty quickly. We won't keep you here too long, but we got snacks to kind of eat over so no one starves and dies. As we hear that's bad. So make sure that everybody's got something to eat. Um, and again, we're going to have some prayer leaders available if um, in the course of this morning you just felt the need to process with somebody. If you need somebody to pray for you, talk with we're going to have leaders available for that as well. Sound good? Awesome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Jesus, we love you. Lord, we thank you for this morning, God. We thank you that you are an excellent God um, and that we have a wonderful model for that, Lord. So we ask that you just energize what was spoken over us today, God, that we would live that excellent life in response to the fact that you lived excellently. Lord, we love you. Thank you. We honor you and we praise you. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much. You are officially dismissed.